we've been studying and thinking about where's God in all of this. And I want to read to you from the Apostle Paul. He actually wrote this letter to the Philippians while he was in prison. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. This is God's word. Hey, y'all, Pastor Tony, we're so happy that you're here with us to worship in the middle of all that's going on in the world. But we know that our God reigns. The psalmist says the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Lord, your throne established long ago, you are from all eternity. Before we go to prayer, we would love to know that you were here with us this morning. So please uh, make a comment below or like it or take a time to share it with somebody that you th think that would really enjoy that. Thank you. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to worship you. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep us under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and the fearful. Lift up all who are brought low that we may rejoice in your comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, you have taught us to love our neighbor and to care for those that are in need. We are trying in this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend to the sick, to, to assure the isolated of our love your love for your name's sake. Jesus, you are merciful and we entrust to your tender care those who are in pain, knowing that whatever danger threatens, your everlasting arms are there to hold them safe. Comfort and heal them, restore them, give them strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, for all those hospital staff, medical researchers that are trying and diligently working to not only comfort those patients, but also to find a cure. Give them the skill, the sympathy, the resilience to all who are caring for the sick and your wisdom for all that are searching for a cure. Strengthen them with your spirit. And through their work, many will be restored to health. We pray all these things in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.
Good morning, Faith Church. Thank you for joining us this morning again uh, for another sermon by Pastor Tony. Uh, we have a message this week for you that we're excited to share, and we're glad that you're tuning in. As always, please click down below. We have a digital connection card for you to check out if there are any prayer concerns that you want Pastor Tony or any of the staff to be aware of. Also during this time, if there are any financial needs or issues within our faith family, please reach out to the church as well. Of course, we're thinking of you and we miss you guys. We will keep you updated with our coronavirus COVID-19 schedule and we will update you in the future uh, of possibilities to come back together. But for now, please enjoy this message from Pastor Tony and know that we miss you guys. Christians for thousands of years have confirmed their faith. And one of the ways we do that is with the Apostles' Creed. The prayer of all prayers is the Lord's Prayer. And the Ten Commandments is the law of all laws. So the Apostles' Creed is the creed of all creeds. The Apostles' Creed takes all of the historical narratives, poems, prophecies, letters, visions, parables that are in the Bible and summarize them into a statement. It is the one way we as believers say, this is what the Bible says. So Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell the third day. He rose again from the dead. He ascendeth into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
all these where's God circumstances. I can't. I can't. I want, I want you to say that with me. I can't. I'm, I don't know if I can hear you from your home, but say it with me. I can't. And that, we feel like that a lot of times. We feel like I just can't do this anymore. Whether it's something related uh, to the whole pandemic, whether it's something related to things that were already going on in my life, or things that got bigger because of the pandemic. We were already having financial struggles, and now we're living on this. Do you ever feel like that? And I think you could be honest. I think you could just go to God and say, God, this is the circumstance. This is, where are you in this? Because he knows what you're thinking anyway. You might as well go to him honestly and say, where are you in this? The amazing thing is we can look back to people in Scripture that have gone through situations that are similar, sometimes situations that are worse, and they can show us how they came through. So if you're in one of those where's God situations, and you're like, I just want my relationships how they should be, but they're not. I've just got this news from the doctor whose now is advice is how to deal, how to cope with what I got because it's not going to change. Maybe it's a career thing, your company, and you went under, and you're 57 years old, and you go, I, I can't start over. I can't learn a whole nother thing. Maybe it's medical bills that are piling up or, or debt, and you think, I can't see the end of this, or a dream that you've always had, and you know now there's no way that's going to happen. This is things that we think, where's God in that? The temptation is to think, I'm never going to be happy. I said this a couple of months ago. Uh, we think, I might as well give up. We think, I can't do that anymore. We just want something to change. Sometimes we don't even care if it's change better, just something different. Maybe we try to run away. Maybe we just try to busy ourselves so we don't have to think about it. We can't remember any time that this, it doesn't even feel right. People are being successful around you and it just exaggerates your pain. And sometimes we get angry and then we get resentful, we get jealous. And at some point we just look up at God and we go, where, where are you? Where's God? God, you could have made me smarter. You could have made me richer. You could have made me prettier, whatever. And if I was that, that was help my problems. We might be even tempted, even tempted to walk away from Jesus, to abandon the faith. Have you ever felt like that? Well, I'm glad you're here today with us. And you're thinking, yeah, I have. Because we're going to look at someone and know how they got through it. This is not a sermon that's going to change the situation for you. Because this might be the situation you're in. But we do know from God's word. We know that when the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi, all the things he had already been through. And there he wrote to them and their heart was breaking for him. But he was okay. He was in a dungeon, in a cell writing a letter. And he says this in Philippians chapter 4. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. He says, guys, y'all, y'all, I have learned something. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I'm not saying that I want this in my life. I'm not saying, Lord, please give Paul another problem. Give me some more pain. No, he's not, he's not praying that. He goes, but I want you to know there is a category of contentment that works in all circumstances. That we, when we are in them, when we're in that where's God moment, when we're in that where's God kind of circumstances, where it looks like this is just going to be the way my life is, and there's nothing that I can do about it. It just is 
what it is. Paul says, there is a way. There is a way to even be content. Uh, Listen, listen, listen. I know it's important. I'm saying listen a lot, but you're obviously sitting at your computer, so, you know. As long as you're not wandering around and you're actually looking at me. Paul was not apathetic. He's not, oh, well, whatever will be, will be. No, in spite of my circumstances, I have learned the secret. I have learned how to be content. Paul is writing to them, and he loves them, and he is telling them, we're going to be able to do this. Here's how to deal. Paul knows what's coming. Paul knows what's already going on. And for the next 300 years, the church will be persecuted. And for the last 2,000 years, somewhere in the world, there's always been persecuting against Christians going on. There are probably millions that are being persecuted right now. The Apostle Paul says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being in tempt in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I have had more than I needed. Great, just a blessing. But I've also have way less than I thought that I needed. And I'm okay with that too. And Paul uses the word here. It's a Greek word. And it's one word, and it's the only time it's used in the whole Bible. And it's mueo. And in English, it means, I have learned the secret. The only time it's used in the Bible, Paul says, I have learned the secret. So they're reading his letter. They know he's in prison. They know everything that's happened to him before. And he goes, contentment. I know it. I know what will bring me contentment. And most of us are saying, I don't know what will bring me contentment. Maybe if I got into the right school. Maybe if I got the right kind of job. Maybe if I looked a little bit better. Then something just falls my way. I just need a little luck. Then I could be contempt if I get that. Now, we all know that's not true. The older that you get, you realize that I always thought that if I got to this point, I would be content. And I'm not content because I'm at that point. Paul is saying, I've learned the real secret of contentment, whether in plenty or in want. And we are not content when we are in this where's God kind of circumstances. And we usually do one of three or four different things. We blame the things, which happens. We actually just blame another person. And that doesn't help. Sometimes we just blame the whole universe. It's all working against me. And the last thing, or maybe even the first thing that we do is we blame the universe. I mean, we blame God. (laughs) We blame others. We blame the circumstance. We blame the universe. And sometimes we even blame God. And we think, I'm never going to trust anymore. I will destroy all of my dreams. I'm not going to be disappointed again because I'm not going to do anything. When we think, I, I just don't care. And that is, beloved, that place of apathy is an awful place to be. You think, maybe my heart has been broken and that's never going to happen again because I'm going to harden it. I'm going to make it a rock. So people have decided since there's nothing on earth that I can do, I'm going to kill the part of me that aspires to anything that is noble or anything is great or anything that's good ever again. And we become cynics. We become hard. And if we blame God. Let me get back to Paul. And I want you to understand this. Paul says... I know the secret. And this is so cool. Do you know what God did while Paul was in prison? Paul spent five years of his ministry in prison. And you know what we have because of that? A whole bunch of books of the New Testament. 
Y'all know what? There's nothing that I can do about the circumstance. I'm here. I'm in the dungeon. I'm locked up. What am I going to do now? Look, what? Where's God in this circumstance? So he thinks, I'm going to write a few letters to some of the churches that I have planted. So he wrote Ephesians. He wrote Philippians. He wrote Colossians. And he wrote Philemon. They are actually called the prison epistles. Now, I don't know how you could write when you were in a dungeon, but it seems like it'd be, you wouldn't even want to do anything. But he says, well, there's nothing else I can do. And Paul is actually going to change most of the world in this, these writings. He's changing the way people view God. People are coming to, to the information of God thousands of years from now. We're still reading his letters. God is using Paul even though he's in this awful situation. And his, his letters, some of them are translated into 2,000 different languages. And people will read them and study them. And billions of people will come to hear and know the message of Jesus because of what he wrote. Billions saved from, from the letters of Paul. The next most translated book in the history of the world is Pinocchio. And it's only translated into 260 languages. The Apostle Paul had no idea what hung in the balance of his decision to remain faithful when remaining faithful was difficult. The Apostle Paul makes a decision to continue to follow Jesus when the circumstances were all against him. God was up to something through Paul. He's in these awful circumstances. And remember, he already has pain. He's already embarrassed. It's already made him weak. And now whatever that is, it's permanent. And now he's in a dungeon. And he says, well, I'm going to write some letters. I, I think about all the jailers that got hooked up to him every day. Eight-hour shift, next jailer. Hey, I'm going to explain this letter that I'm writing to the church. And we actually know that there were thousands of people in a whole different realm of Rome that are becoming Christians because they're part of the people that were guarding him, jailers, and then their family started to know. I mean, it's actually really, really amazing. The Apostle Paul is a prisoner, and he writes a copy, and he goes, I want to deliver this. And we're still reading it today. What hung in the balance of Paul's decision to remain faithful? Wow. I don't think Paul probably had any idea what was going to happen. But do we know now, looking back on it, what was hanging in the balance? Yeah, a whole bunch of the Bible. The church is actually learning because he was in prison. And it's so important. The reason he was able to accomplish what he did was because of the adversity that he had and, and the way that he responded to the adversity. Now, here's why that's a big deal. And I want everybody to like look at your screen now, pay attention. You have no idea. You have no idea what hangs in the balance of your life because you made the decision to remain faithful, to believe God, to trust God. You know, no idea of what God might do through your faithfulness when the things around you are just like, where's God in this? And we think, you know what? There's no point in being moral. There's no point in being faithful to any of this anymore. There's no point of staying with Jesus or the church. Why should I be obedient? This is how my life's going to be anyway, and I'm not happy. There's no point in saying yes to God because my circumstances are terrible, and I just can't anymore. I just can't. Listen, beloved. You have no idea what God's going to use. If that's the decision that you made and this tragedy is going on in your life and you remain faithful in the midst of the adversity, what God might do through that. And we might not ever know until we see Jesus. Oftentimes it's when the context of the adversity that God does his most amazing things in us and through us and in the world. This is a big deal. Because we think, I just can't. 
We think, I can't. And Paul says, I know the secret. And we're like, I'm done. I can't pay attention. I can't do this. I don't want to do this. And Paul gives us the answer. He says, it'd be way better for you. I know persecution's going on. I know your families are getting split up. You're losing your businesses. He knows what's going on. And he writes this letter. And they know what's already going on with him and where he's at now. And they're brokenhearted for him because they can't go make him free. And he says, I can do everything through him who strengthens, who gives me strength. Here's the secret. And the secret is actually something miraculous. It's actually something spiritual that's going on. And, and when we're in those moments, we're looking up and go, where's God? I, don't, I think I just can't anymore. Here's what we need to do. What Paul is telling us to do. And when we're praying and we're looking up and we said, I don't know where you are, God. Where are you? I just can't. The Apostle Paul says, yeah, but he can. Jesus can. A couple of months ago, I said this over and over again. We say, I can't. But listen, Paul says, he can. I can't do this. But Jesus can do through you. I can't handle this anymore. But Jesus can handle it. I can't do it. He can. Say that with me. I can't, but he can. And we're thinking, I can't. These relationships, I can't, but he can. He can't through me. He's in us. Just think about that. Whether it's financial bills that are piling up, and they've already piled up. They were already, before all the shutdown happened, so many friends that are not going to be able to even go back to work or they're going to have to look for a whole other field to work in. Maybe the doctor came and gave you news and since the pandemic, all the stuff started, you really can't have any follow-up with it. And we think, I just can't, I just can't. And realize, he can. He can. I can't, but he can. I know that it's difficult. And I, I, you could just be honest with God. If you've got doubts, if you've got Hurts if you got, I can't fix it. Go to him. Because the Apostle Paul says, I know the secret. It's a spiritual secret. And you could ask me, Pastor Tony, how do you know? We are so vulnerable, but God is in control. And we need him. And we need him to be with us. We need him to be in our lives. We need him to intercede for us, praying for us. But we also remember, beloved, 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 if you were followed of Jesus, if you're a Christian, what is our hope really in? What's our hope really in? All people, according to Jesus, lives in a grip of a pandemic called sin. What is our hope In the face of that virus. The story of the Bible is the story of God. Who entered the world infected with this virus. And he lived among all of us who were sick. Breathing the same air as we do. Eating the same food as we do. And eventually put on a cross. And he died in isolation. Excluded from his own people. And from God the Father. That he might provide this sick world with an antidote to the virus and give us eternal life. Hear this. Hear Jesus' words. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me lives even though he dies. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Jesus says, do you believe me? Do you believe me on this? Because of Jesus. Here's how I know. I can't, but he can. Because Jesus carried that cross. He prayed for the soldiers to be forgiven because they really didn't know what they were doing. And then on the cross, he took our punishment, our hell, our sins. And then on the third day, he showed the victory over that by being raised to life. So, beloved, where are you in all of this? I'm going to pray, and I want you to stay with me through this. Father, we're in situations where we're looking up and we're going, where's God? 
And you show us that you care and you show us that you love us because you sent your son into this world that he might live the life that we should have lived. And he took the punishment that we should have taken. And he looks at us and says, there is no condemnation. You are forgiven. You are washed. You are clean. And, and we get this. Listen, if you don't know Jesus, listen to this. We get the standing. We get forgiveness because of his death on the cross. And we get his life. So when the father looks at us, he sees how Jesus lived his life. Beloved, that's amazing news. And you could, you could right now say, I believe. I'm going to trust Jesus in the circumstance. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, here's your blessing. You can go in peace, not because of the circumstances. Because I'm going to say I can't. But I know that he can. Amen.